Hello, everybody, and welcome to our week 30. I, we have made our initial goal, which was to get 30 different doctors to each talk about the just one thing they like to see somebody learn more about and one habit to change on their journey to a much healthier and better lifestyle. Well, today we're really honored to have Dr. Martika Heener with us, and she's going to talk about being mindful about food and nutrition, and she's an expert at it, and we look forward to getting lots of great information from Martika. And with us, we have Lori DiPietro Standen, who's uh, a nutritionist, a certified nutrition, nutritional coach, and she has some questions for Martika. And with that, I will hand it over to Lori and Martika. So thank you so much for joining us and for being with us throughout the 30 weeks that, that we, we've been doing and we look forward to much, much more in the future. So thank you. I think it, um, it would be awesome if Dr. Heiner, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about um, your background um, for those who aren't familiar with you yet. Okay. Um, hi, Peter and hi, Lori. Um, I have a kind of eclectic background that is in fitness and nutrition. So uh, I started off when I was in high school teaching aerobics quite a long time ago. So I, I actually still am a group fitness instructor. And, um, and then after college, I majored in English Lit and Exercise Science. And then I um, continued teaching aerobics and then I got very involved in the fitness industry. And I lived in London for 12 years. And while I was in London, I did a bunch of fitness videos. I, um, I had a fitness TV show. I, I also became a health journalist and I started writing for all the different magazines and newspapers there and wrote a bunch of books while I was in England. And then fitness magazine hired me and um, moved me to New York. And so I became the fitness director of fitness magazine. And that was an amazing job. That was really fun. And, uh, and then I decided I, I, I left that after a couple of years. And then I went to glamor magazine for a, a while filling in. Uh, and then I decided to go back to grad school. And so I went back to grad school. What for what was initially a master's in exercise physiology. And then once I got that, I realized I didn't know anything. And so I might, I could still, you know, I could stay in school some more. So I ended up getting a master's in nutrition. And then I, you know, realized I still, there was still so much more to know, to learn. And so I decided to get the PhD and that, you know, kept me in many more years. And the whole time I was doing that, I was still writing. I was still teaching fitness. Um, I was writing for the New York times and different magazines and um, wrote a few more books. And, uh, and then I finally got my PhD. It was all sort of an accident because that wasn't my initial intention. Um, and then I, that kind of took me into an academic route. And so I started, I became a professor at Hunter College in New York, which um, I still am today. And that was, I've been a professor there for nine years and a nutrition professor. And I also did some research, um, postdoc research, uh, looking at obesity and exercise. And um, so anyway, so I'm currently based in Texas. I came back home to help my father out a few years ago, and um, I'm still teaching fitness classes. I still um, write for various publications, and I'm still a, a nutrition professor, although now I'm teaching online for Hunter. Um, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, <laughs> my crazy uh, background. And how long have you been plate-based? I have been a vegan for uh, I, about six years. It's, it's sort of hard to pinpoint it exactly because I was a vegetarian for 32 years. And, um, and then I discovered by complete accident that, uh, dairy was causing my asthma and I was on two inhalers. I was on Advair, a daily inhaler and albuterol, the emergency inhaler. My doctor kept insisting it was my one cat. Um, I knew it wasn't my cat because I had had two cats and one died. And so I had 50% less cat. So I knew it, you know, if anything, I would have better asthma rather than worse asthma. Um, and um, so I basically, you know, kept taking the inhalers, knew it wasn't my cat, but just thought, oh, I have asthma. But then one time I was in the country in Connecticut and I'd just gone to a farmer's market and I got, I got an iced coffee with milk in it. And I, I have those every day and I don't know 
you know, why this one particular time I suddenly had this reaction, but I took one sip of it and my throat started immediately swelling up. I basically had an anaphylactic reaction and I thought I was going to die. I literally thought I was going to die. I've never been that scared in my life. I, I, for, I couldn't breathe. And luckily it subsided almost as quickly as it came on. And I was sort of like, Oh my God, what was that? And I was looking at my iced coffee. I'm like, was it the dairy? So you would think that I would have learned something about the connection between dairy and asthma studying at Columbia University and doing my PhD. But somehow <laughs> this information, which is out there, escaped me. And um, so I went home and I literally Googled dairy and asthma. And sure enough, there was a bunch of research and just, you know, random websites about it too. Some of it wasn't research. But, um, and I'm like, wow, really? Could that milk be causing my asthma? So I decided to give it up and I gave up dairy. So I became, I went from vegetarian to vegan and um, I gave it up for a year and I actually cured myself. I had no asthma for a year and I, I was not using my inhalers. I never used them. I never needed them. Um, and then I started missing cheese. And um, so I would go out to restaurants and I decided, okay, I'll just eat a little cheese. So I'd eat nachos. And then I started noticing that every time I did, I would get like phlegm in my throat, mucus. And if I ate a lot, like if I ate a big thing of nachos, I would get a lot and it would clog me up so much that I'd get asthma. And if I ate a little, it would just be a little bit like having to clear your throat or something. And so, you know, if initially I thought, okay, I, I now know that cheese is the problem and, and dairy is a problem. It would happen with milk or yogurt, you know, any dairy product. Um, but I really liked, you know, cheese so much. I decided, well, you know, I, I can handle a little bit. I'll just live with the symptoms. And then I found out shortly thereafter, after that decision, what the dairy cows go through and how much suffering they go through. And I had no idea about that. And my, you know, my only regret um, having, you know, gone vegan is that I didn't do it 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Um, so many people say that. It seems like every person you talk to, they, that's, their, that's the only regret is that they didn't do it sooner. Yeah, I really, I mean, I didn't know what I didn't know, but in some ways there's no excuse that I didn't know because I should have known, especially the nutritional component and connection with asthma. But yeah, anyway, it's, it is what it is. So yeah, so I don't have an exact date, but I think yeah. about six, six to seven years because there was that year that I, I did give it up and then I started eating a little bit and that was just for a few months. And anyway, so I don't, some people have like their exact date. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anniversary and, I don't have one of those. So their, their began anniversary. I see people <laughs> post that all the time. Yeah. Um, so, but tonight you want to talk to us about how tracking your food can really help you zero in on your micronutrients and um, help you improve your health. And I, what I read um, about you, which is so true, is that we think or, or something that you had said was that we always think that we're being way more healthy with our habits than we actually are if you're just going by what you think in your head um, and then once you see it down in print you're like oh that's not as healthy as i thought it was so where you know how 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 does a person um tell us how when you when you guide people towards that how do you tell them to get started and and what are the things they're looking for Okay. Well, I think the first thing that, you know, to acknowledge is that, yeah, we, we, you know, everybody thinks they eat better than, than they do. I mean, and it's, it's sort of like, we just want to think the best of ourselves <laughs> in general. And, um, and so it's, it's, you know, I, there was one, one girl I was working with and she was a whole food plant-based vegan. So she was very adamant that she ate healthfully and she, um, said she was going to go back. She was start actually had started eating eggs again because she, her hair was falling out and she had no energy. And so knowing that that's not a symptom of not eating meat because otherwise everyone would have that, you know, it's clearly something she was doing wrong. And so I said, well, are you eating enough? And you know, are you eating enough whole plant foods? What are you eating? And she said, Oh no, I'm on a whole food plant-based diet. I eat very healthfully. Yes, I'm eating enough. And um, so 
uh, I was skeptical because you don't just lose your hair. You know, usually it's a, a protein deficiency or a lack of calories. Um, and feeling tired, you know, could be any number of micronutrients as well as a lack of calories. Um, so anyway, it turns out she'd been keeping her um, food logs for a, a long time um, on one of these apps. So she allowed me access to her apps and her. So I saw what she had been logging and she literally, this is, you know, what she ate every day consisted of mostly kind bars which, you know, are, you know, they're, they have healthful components, but they're sort of a glorified candy bar. I mean, they're a little healthier than that, but um, she was eating potato chips and or cookies on most days. Um, she did have, she would have some strawberries or a spinach salad or something like that. And so I'm sure she was, uh, she was pretty young. She was in her twenties. Um, I'm sure that compared to her friends, she was probably eating much healthy, healthier than, than they were. And I know that from my students, I, you know, I have, a lot of college students and I see all of their their diet logs and so what some of what they eat is truly horrifying I mean it's you know <laughs> yeah. there's not a, a green thing anywhere in the vicinity for days on end um, but she yeah there was she was entirely micronutrient and protein deficient and she wasn't getting enough calories to fuel her energy expenditure so while she actually was eating quite a lot she was also exercising quite a lot and she was oh i think it was you know more than a thousand calories and sometimes two thousand calories in deficit energy deficit um you know she was doing a lot of exercise and so uh anyway she uh i pointed this out to her and she actually her her um, response was, well, you know, if I can't follow this diet and eat what I enjoy, then it's not the diet for me. <laughs> so in other words, if I can't eat um, junk food, uh, potato chips and cookies on a, an, on a regular basis uh, and, you know, eat very few plant foods then. So, you know, we, we definitely have blinders up and it's very hard to, you know, change what you like to eat. And, and there's a, we all know it happens because all the people who do uh, start eating whole food plant-based, you know, they, everybody used to love bacon and that now suddenly they don't, they don't want it anymore and they your don't taste change. change. Yeah. Your taste change. And um, so anyway, um, so yeah, it's important to kind of put the spotlight on what you're eating because then you can see what you're really eating, not just what your perception of what you're eating, you know, right. might and that seems like a big one. I know um, in the in the vegan and vegetarian groups that I'm in, um, people will every once in a while say, "I feel like I'm having more hair loss," um, and you know, inevitably someone will say, "Add eggs or add," you know, right. someone will always chime in with a little bit of that. Um, but well, I, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I mean that's it's really what you know, if you had to encapsulate your advice to that person, because I do feel like also, so to balance out what you're saying, because as you know, it's so many people say that because you're on a vegan diet, how are you, how on earth are you getting your protein? Um, and so what, what do you tell people um, about that? Well, first of all, I think, you know, we all have our standard responses to that, which are all true. And that is every plant food contains protein, even fruit. And where do the biggest mammals on the planet, planet like hippopotamuses and, you know, gorillas, gorillas and, and all the other big mammals, and, right, gorillas, yes. everyone else, uh, elephants get their protein and it's from plant foods, from leaves and, and, and grass and, and other plant foods. So, but I think because we, that is a, a, a true thing, there's a, a common misconception that just because you're vegan, you're getting enough protein. And that is not actually the case. And I see it all the time in logs, um, people's diet logs. So if you're eating a lot of processed food or not eating enough calories, you could very well be low in protein. Just as I see this in my students, the majority of my students are not vegans or vegetarians. Um, and if you're a vegetarian, I mean, you're eating dairy products. I mean, that's, that's animal products. You're going to be getting, in most cases, enough protein if you're eating enough calories. But I see this in um, many of my students that they're not getting enough protein, even though they might be eating mostly meat, 
or animal products, meat and dairy, but it's because they're not eating enough calories. You know, I, some of the girls are eating a thousand calories and they might need, you know, 2,800 calories or 2,000. Right. And um, I is don't. There, I'm sorry. Is there a certain percentage that you tell people to look for or is there a formula that you tell them to use or just the standard RDA? Um, well, so I think with percentages, it's important to, you know, distinguish between um, you know, most people, unless you're taking, you're doing a diet log, you cannot choose your foods and, and know what your percentage is unless right. you're actually doing a log. Um, so, uh, but it's, but you know, so that's one reason why tracking your diet is really important. So you get some idea of what you're at and tracking what you normally eat because you start eating better once you start tracking. So you want to not do that while you're tracking just to get a good picture of what you're doing. Um, in all its, you know, glory or in all of, all of its, you know, terrible. <laughs> and, um, and I always tell my students that at the beginning of the semester, because they, you know, immediately get inspired by what they're reading and they want to start eating better. And, and we have a di big diet project at the end. And I, I keep telling them, don't start eating your vegetables until after you've captured this information in your dialogue. Um, but, uh, I think the, um, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> Oh, I was just asking about like when you talk to people about amounts of protein, like if they're on a vegan diet. That's right. So, um, so if you're on a very low calorie diet, you know, if, 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 if someone is dieting, then you do want a higher percentage of protein. We need a minimum amount of protein and that's determined by your body weight. So we have our standard RDA formula, which is 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So that works out, you know, on average to be, you know, 40 to 50 grams of protein for most people, you know, that's going to vary depending on your weight. Um, now there are some instances, uh, circumstances where you might need more. If you're an endurance athlete, you might need more. If you're a novice bodybuilder, you might need more. Um, if you're a burn victim, you will need more. If you're sick or healing, you might need more. There's different, you know, um, if you're a vegan, it is suggested you might need more. Um, but the more is still not any more than double the RDA. So maybe, you know, at most two grams per kilogram of body weight. And most people are already getting that. And people that are actually actively trying to eat protein with every meal and making sure they're putting some protein powder in their smoothie and mm. adding protein, protein to their salad or whatever it is. Um, I mean, you know, I, people are getting three times, four times or more of the RDA or of their essential amino acids. So, you know, protein deficiency, unless you're not eating enough calories or you're eating a ton of processed food, you're eating, you know, uh, potato chips and uh, a lot of fast food, even, even eating a fast food diet, like eating hamburgers every meal, people are getting enough protein usually. So, um, but, so, but if you're trying to diet and a lot of people are trying to diet, and so you are cutting out what you eat, you might not be getting enough protein. And I've seen this actually with people doing the ketogenic diet. Um, mm -hmm. I had a student, he had lost about 60 pounds doing the keto diet. And he was very proud that he wasn't hungry and that he had lost so much weight. And, you know, he was still trying to lose more. He was still very overweight. Um, but when he finally did his nutritional profile, he was eating 800 calories a day, not being hungry, eating 800 calories a day. Now, some might see that as a benefit, but when you looked at his entire nutrient analysis, he was low in pretty much every micronutrient and he was deficient in protein and essential amino acids. So, you know, is weight loss worth all, you know, all that you're lacking in your diet? And um, so there's a, you know, there's such a focus on weight loss and the quality of the diet matters. And actually a new study just came out in the past couple of days in JAMA, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association, looking at the quality of car carbohydrates. And a lot of the people on the meat, me eating side of the nutrition, you know, Twitter spear world, um, they like, they always seem to um, lump processed carbs with whole food plant-based diets and they can't be farther, you know, from two different things. I mean, nobody is recommending you eat 
potato chips and french fries. <laughs> right. And it's then they then so apparently the answer is because some carbohydrate based foods are bad, let's cut out all carbs. Right. Which right. doesn't make I tell people this all the time. I'm like, if just because some water sources are polluted, I would never tell you to cut out all water. We right. need our carbohydrates. Right. That's a really good example actually. So yeah. so as far as the percentages go, so this is, you know, we need a, a minimum amount of protein to, you know, for our protein needs that our body uses protein for. So, um, so we need to get that amount. So if you're cutting your calories, you may need to increase your percentage. So mm -hmm. currently the uh, acceptable macronutrient distribution range, the AMDR is 10 to 30% protein, 10, 10 to 30% of your daily uh, energy intake should be protein. Now we know if you're eating naturally, a, a a whole food plant-based diet, you're probably going to get about 10% just naturally. That's about what's in breast milk. I think it might even be 8% in bre breast milk. Um, but if you're cutting your calories low and you're at 10%, then you may actually not be getting your minimum quota that you do need for your body. So you might need to up that percentage. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're exercising a lot, let's say, let's take an extreme example, like Michael Phelps, the Olympic swimmer. So he's famous for allegedly eating 10,000 calories a day. Now, if he ate 30% of his calories as protein, um, I don't have the math. I have figured out the math before, um, but you know that's 3,000 calories worth of protein, which is, uh, what is that? Figure out in grams. I should be able to do that, that in my head, but I can't. 750 grams of protein, which, it's just protein overload. I mean, right. his, uh, you know, his, uh, his probably what he needs. I mean, I don't know what he weighs, but you know, let's say it might be 150, maybe 200, not 750. So what's going to happen to that excess protein? It, it will turn to fat if he is eating a high protein diet. And, um, so, and, and because he's a severe endurance athlete, he needs carbs to fuel that energy expenditure. Right. So, um, so if you're eating, you know, and that's a, a, a big, uh, that's the other end of the spectrum, but you know, if someone who's eating 3000 calories or 4000 calories, they don't need to be on the higher end of that range. I mean, we don't have any research that suggests they do. Um, so you might, you know, it's, it's really a better way to do it is based on your weight, I think, and then your special needs. So whether you're an endurance athlete or a novice weightlifter or whatever, um, right. or you're ill or you're elderly or whatever. Yeah. But then, you know, and, but then, you know, rather than, again, we have such a focus on macronutrients that, um, really we want to be making sure we're getting enough fiber and enough of all the vitamins and minerals that we know are essential and we know we need. And, and what's interesting is that there's a great fiber deficiency, um, all, you know, in, in the developed countries who are people who are eating processed foods, a huge, huge, um, you know, deficiency. And, and the amount of fiber you're eating is directly correlated to your micronutrient intake. So I see this all the time. I know, you know, when, when I see a, a, someone's food logs and they're getting 10 grams of protein a day or 15 or 20 even, they're going to be low in micronutrients. I mean, it's, it's the micronutrients, you know, are more prevalent in your whole plant foods. So, right. especially. So, so what do you tell people? Um, because that's, you know, Obviously, that's the whole reason beh behind why a whole food plant-based diet is more healthy because you are getting all of that fiber, all of those nutrients, assuming you're doing it the right way, like you talked about at the beginning. Um, so what, and, and like you said, the, the focus on macronutrients is just over the top. Um, but I know today um, you wanted to focus on what are the micronutrients that people really should be looking at? Because the people are not educated in that. And I don't think they know what to look for. Yeah. Well, so we need, you know, we have a, a list of essential vitamins and minerals. And so we need them all for our cells to perform their functions. So every um, uh, biochemical reaction in the body has lots of different steps and lots of different uh, compounds that go in and help, you know, the cell go through whatever process it's, it's going through. And that's, you know, everything from, you know, building muscles, 
to healing, you know, healing some tissue, to making some of your different organs do what they do, to helping digestion occur, to helping, you know, your thoughts occur, everything, anything going on in your body. And um, so we, we know that there are some uh, acknowledged and uh, measured common deficiencies. And they're often not what people think. So fiber is one, and fiber is not actually considered to be an essential nutrient. And um, that's just historically, it was only thought to be important for you know good bowel movements. But uh, now with, the, with all of the new research about the microbiome, the, the bacteria that live in our body, the bacteria, virus, and fung fungi that live in our body, um, collectively known as the microbiome and, and specifically, you know, in our gut, they have, they, that, those, that microbiome has such an important role in our health. It's, we, there's a lot, we don't know about it, but one thing that we do know is that there's different ratios of different, of, of wide variety of bacteria. What we eat selectively determines what kind of bacteria and how much and the proportions of all the bacteria that we have. And we know that when you eat animal foods, you have more of the bacteria that um, are produce more inflammatory compounds. And when you eat lots of whole plant foods and fiber that comes with, a whole, with all whole plant foods, um, you actually feed the beneficial bacteria. And there's a lot of interesting research um, you know, there's a lot we don't know about this. We know that someone who does eat meat, the more plant foods they eat, they're going to actually ameliorate some of the negative effects that come from eating the animal products. So, you know, on the, the spectrum from meat eating to, you know, raw vegan, if you're going to the extreme, the more plants you can eat, the better. Um, whole food plant-based is probably optimal. I mean, uh, you know, you get all of your nutrients, barring B12 from a whole food plant-based diet, assuming you're eating enough and you're choosing truly whole plant foods. So a lot of people are not only deficient in fiber, but they're de deficient in potassium. And potassium comes from whole plant foods. Um, vitamin K is another one. And people are so worried about calcium. Vitamin K has many important roles in our body, but one role is with bone health. So everyone's so worried about getting the you know, dairy products, which are inflammatory for a lot of people and causing you know, gut issues for a lot of people and just contributing to you know, many health conditions. Uh, we don't know exactly the mechanisms, but um, definitely playing some role because a lot of when people take dairy out of their diet, uh, they often see all of these health conditions reverse. Um, even when they had no idea there was a connection. Um, yeah, my if people are always shocked when when I first start talking to them about dairy because especially in this country we're conditioned, you know that you know gut milk and all of that like it's and you can't also build healthy bones without milk. Yeah. Um, and I challenge them, you know, like we have the second highest osteoporosis rate in the world. And we're one of the highest dairy consumers, so it doesn't make the same amount of sense. And also, like you said, your bone health, it, your, your bone isn't 100% calcium. That's not, you know, there's so many more components and people don't, you know, really realize all that goes into, it's like you said, it's not just a few different vitamins. They all work in concert. Yeah, um, and, and what a lot of people don't realize, too, is that there is um, not a clear consensus on how much calcium we actually need. And in fact, so the recommendations in the US are, are DRIs, our dietary reference intakes, uh, the RDA is to get 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. Um, now in the UK, they have their own evidence-based guidelines and they've reviewed the research and they say you only need 700 milligrams a day. And there are, there are um, countries around the world where um, women are getting 300 or 500 milligrams a day and not having signs of osteoporosis. So we have been definitely um, fed a lot of uh, uh, PR from the dairy industries who it's in their best interest to promote uh, calcium as being the most important nutrient you should you know, be concerned about. Um, and you know, saying that, people may not be getting enough if they're eating a lot of 
you know, junk food and fast food and processed food, which most of America is doing. So, um, but yeah, but getting, I wouldn't the, choose to get it from dairy. I would choose to get it from whole plant foods. Yeah. Right. Which people don't, most people don't realize you can even get it from other foods. Um, but I find that a lot of people will say, okay, um, I'm deficient in calcium. I have, you know, my doctor says I'm deficient and they end up taking these huge amounts of supplements. Um, and so what is your, do you have a view on that? Because I know there's different conflicting things out there. Some, some things that I've read said that that's not really the way to go because that calcium collects other places and causes problems because there's, it's so much. Do you have thoughts on that one way or the other? Is it more just like concentrate on the food sources? Yeah, I think, I mean, there are, there are definitely some uh, potential concerns with calcium su supplements. And um, Dr. Greger on nutritionfacts.org has several videos on that, which I would recommend, you know, looking at um, for anyone that's, you know, concerned about that. But no, I mean, I wouldn't recommend taking calcium. Um, you know, it's, the thing about supplements is we tend to think um, it's, you know, a supplement is like a magic pill and, but it's always, you know, almost always better to get a, a, a nutrient from a food source. And again, you might not need as much as, as you think you need. And, um, and you can, you can get, you, you know, you can get your calcium requirements if you even need that much, um, from whole plant foods. Now there's often, um, <clears throat> people think that fiber, if you eat a lot of fiber, you might interfere with the absorption of different minerals. Um, there's not really a lot of evidence of that. And if high fiber diets were a problem with mineral absorption, um, then all of the cultures and people who uh, are on very high fiber diets, eating lots of whole plant foods would show signs of these conditions. And, and the research just doesn't show that. Um, in fact, we have, um, you know, the people who eat the highest fiber diets, the most whole plant foods tend to be the healthiest and have the lowest incidence of chronic diseases. So, um, yeah. And that's what you were saying too. It, it is so fascinating. Um, all the research that's coming out about the, the gut biome. Um, it, it's really as it pertains to uh, your mental health, um, and as it pertains to even your hormones because of where your estrogen is metabolized, I just think that people don't realize when you have an unhealthy gut. And then on top of that, you have people taking PPIs, which is also disrupting all of that. Um, I don't think people realize that there are natural, it's not just you eat the bad foods and then you take the supplements and you take the PPIs and that fixes everything. Like you said, it's not a magic pill. It's it's actually changing your habits and changing the way that you view food and, and how you eat. Well, and also one of the analogies I like to give, um, and in, in some of my talks, I have this picture of a bathtub full of marbles. And so when we, you know, all of the nutrients that we consume, all of the foods that we eat have the nutrients in their, you know, synergistic proportions in that food. And we know we need certain of some things and our body just kind of figures it out, right? And foods have it naturally built into, into um, the food. Now, when you take a supplement, you're taking usually what's known as a pharmacological dose. And that's a dose of the supplement that's like way more than you could ever get in food. And you would have to eat like, you know, I don't know you know, 50 bananas to get the same amount of potassium that you'd get from the pill. Um, or, you know, that's an example, just depending on the nutrient. But um, and so what happens, like you have your bathtub full of marbles, which is your body and everything sort of in proportion. And what happens when you shove like a hundred new marbles into that bathtub, then everything else has to shift and you really kind of, you don't know what you're doing. And then when you have lots of supplements, you know, all going in and you don't know, like nobody knows, most people aren't testing for deficiency. That's, that's when you, you know, you know, you, you might need to supplement. So, but if you don't know, it's like, it's a big crapshoot. You're just being, you know, playing guinea pig with yourself. And I've seen, you know, some people are taking, you know, 15 or 20 pills a day, all of these random things. And it's, I think, especially with keto, um, 
you know, not to make this about that, but I know that has to be part of the, the regime because it is, you are vitamin deficient. Um, and so they take, I know people who are literally taking hundreds of dollars in supplements every month wow. um, to be on a keto diet. And I, you know, my challenge to them is how do you know that's doing the same thing that eating whole foods would do? You well, know, that's, they don't, and it's not, is the answer. And, and the thing is, it's, you know, the other, the other thing about supplements is that there's so many other compounds, phytochemicals in plant foods that um, we don't have pills for. And even if we did have pills for them, you, I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands, you just can't clearly take all those pills and we don't even have those. So if you're not eating the real food, you are missing out on things and you don't even know what you're missing out on. And you're missing out on some of these phytochemicals that we know are, um, are, you know, cancer preventing and antioxidants and do all sorts of beneficial things. So, um, yeah, it's, I, you know, supplements have a role for sure, but, um, we tend to believe, you know, that that's, they're a magic pill and there's great power in the supplement and there's probably more power in our food. Nutrition is medicine. And that's why we have this whole, you know, uh, burgeoning movement of plant-based physicians and, you know, this whole, hopefully our whole health system is going to acknowledge this soon. So now, so far you've mentioned a few things for people to look for. Um, and you said potassium, you said vitamin K, um, what in B12, of course, um, and most of us, I think, you know, even as we know, people who are not vegan or vegetarian many times need to supplement in B12, it's generally good practice. Um, but what else do you have like, what else would you say to look for? I know you can't tell us everything in, in the short amount of time that we have, but if you had like some top uh, things to look for, what would you tell people? Well, um, I mean, that question, it really is an individual thing because I could, you know, say what, what is most commonly um, people are going to be low in and certainly fiber and potassium are going to be one of the things, two of those things, um, you know, possibly calcium, possibly iron. Um, although uh, you know, it's really like, it just depends on your food choices and if you're getting enough of the food you need. Um, but what I, what I advise in the video that I did for this, uh, challenge for the just one thing for health challenge is, um, is basically to say, okay, choose a dietary app. I use chronometer. I, I it's a really nice and e e easy to use user-friendly app but there's other ones as well. I don't know how all the other ones work as well, but when you put your food in, so you wanna log everything pretty carefully. I explain a little bit in, in, in our challenge video how to do that. Um, then you look at the results and you're gonna see um, what you're low in. You're gonna see what you get enough in uh, of. And so what you're low in, you then wanna figure out, okay, how can I boost that? Am I getting too much of, or am I eating you know, too much bad foods that might crowd out my whole food choices that I should be eating. And that's what I find happens a lot. I mean, even with, with, I, you know, I'm guilty of that too. It's like, you might eat something, you know, that's not that healthy. And then it makes, you know, it could be like a chocolate bar or anything. It could be anything. And then you're just, you don't actually feel like having a salad or you don't feel like eating something healthy. And I think it's really important to recognize that because just because you're not hungry, people seem to think that's a good thing. It's not always a good thing <laughs> because if you're, if you're not eating foods you should eat because of that, then you're impairing your, your health really. And, and you might be able to handle it for a few days or a few weeks, but long-term, if that's a regular dietary pattern, you know, things are going to start breaking down and that's when health conditions start developing. So look at your food results, your nutrient output after you've entered ideally seven days or more of what you eat into one of these apps and then see what you're low in. Uh, I, I showed on the challenge video that on chronometer, at least, I don't know about other apps, but if you click on any of the items, it will, a box will pop up and it will show you, which foods that you ate in that day um, contributed to that particular nu nutrient. So let's say you're low in iron. Um, 
then you can see which foods gave you iron. And so the easiest way to improve on your micronutrient deficiencies, and let's just also emphasize it's potential deficiencies, because unless you're actually measuring, taking blood tests and any other kind of measures there might be, we don't actually know you're deficient, but your potential, you know, you're not getting enough in your diet. So you can then just, if you see it's, you know, you're getting iron from lentils, well, and you're eating a half a cup of lentils, which is supposedly a serving. I I don't know who eats half a cup of lentils. I eat like, (laughs) I mean. I can barely eat half a cup cup of hummus. People are like, it's two tablespoons of hummus. I'm like, who does that? What? Yeah. Well, I know. And I'm, I eat like a whole can of beans. And that's like, I know. I'm that's the same like, way. Like, I love cups of, or three and a half servings or something. Anyway, it's, I, it's very unrealistic. And so therefore all of these foods also have the false reputation of not providing a lot of protein or a lot of, you know, fiber even, but when you're eating an actual real portion size, which is something, you know, hefty on your plate. And when you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you can eat actually more in quantity because you're getting fewer calories because you're not eating as much fat. There's, you know, less fat in the food and that has fewer calories. So, um, but anyway, so uh, look at, you know, you can spot what you're low in and just increase your portion. So if you normally eat, you know, put a a half a cup of beans on your salad or whatever, um, we'll bump it up to one and a half cups, double it um, uh, or triple it. And, uh, and then, or, Find new foods. So if you see that, you know, you're low in another nutrient, just do a little Google or Bing search and figure out what foods you might like that contain that nutrient. Yeah, and- I, started, I started putting pumpkin seeds on my oats in the morning because I, my, everyone in my family, all the women tend to be iron deficient. Mm-hmm. And so I, um, I started, you know, I would, I, same, just what you said. I was like, okay, I, you know, so I start looking it up and, and so there's easy, there's easy and yummy fixes to all of this yeah. stuff. Well, and that's the thing too. People don't realize it's, it's usually like little things you can just add. Seeds are amazing. All the different seeds have so many minerals and different, you know, nutrients in them and omega three fatty acids. So if you're low on that, everyone thinks they should go to fish. Well, you're probably going to get some mercury and other toxic things from your fish. Right. So uh, why don't you just get some chia seeds or flax seeds or, you know, hemp hearts and, or even, you know, a lot of people, one of my favorite examples is that um, if you ate about 1200 calories uh, worth of broccoli or asparagus, I haven't done it with every vegetable, but just plugging it into these apps, you would actually get every single nutrient you need except for B12. Every single, mm-hmm. every single one, including omega threes, including all your essential amino acids. Now, granted, that's a lot of broccoli. <laughs> but I would say I probably eat that in a week, though. So that's really great for my broccoli addiction, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's great. It's like broccoli for lunch, breakfast, and dinner, and snack. <laughs> um, you can cook it. You can cook it. But uh, but that's kind of a good illustration that you know, even if you ate like a ton of all the same plant food, and that would be, you know, let's say the average calorie intake is 2000 calories or 2,500 or 300, that's only 50% or less of your calories for the day. So you could eat other stuff, but you would have met all your nutrient needs. And what's sad about that is that really illustrates how terribly people eat because, you know, for most people eating about 2000 calories a day, more or less, they're not even 50% of what they're eating is whole plant foods. And so they're, you know, that's why everybody, I mean, there's a nationwide deficiency in, you know, many and obesity and fiber yeah. and obesity because people are eating so many calories that have nothing in them. They have no nutrition, no fiber. And so I try to explain people that your body is still crying out for more yeah. and not, and not more junk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, there's a lot we don't know. There's certainly a lot we don't understand and that we need to research. But I do think that there is there has to be some, you know, intuitive response that when our body isn't getting all these micronutrients it needs, that um, you know, not only are things kind of starting to fall apart internally, but you know, it probably prompts us to crave sweets or crave something and the body's craving more food because it's not getting the nutrients that it needs, which is what food is supposed to provide. But mm-hmm. now we're not eating, you know, what we're eating is, you, it's questionable whether you can actually call it food. It's right. 
opposing I, food, right? Like Cheetos, are they really a food? Or well, they- and I've heard that McDonald's has to call their uh, foods food products. They're not even allowed to call them some of their stuff food. So I do think that, yeah, it's, you know, does your body even really recognize it? Yeah, is a tater tot, is a tater tot food? Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, I don't know, a lot of this process stuff, yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's really important that we not just focus <clears throat> on the macronutrients, the protein and the fat and have big fights about how much is, do we need or on just calories because the calories will sort themselves out. Right. Um, if you're choosing whole plant foods, for sure, right. and, and getting fiber. So um, I want to go ahead and wrap it up, but what, is there any, um, I'm, and we'll definitely, the video that you referenced, we'll definitely get that posted in the Facebook group so that anyone who wasn't able to see it on the site can, can view all of that. But um, any parting words that you have for people who will be watching the video? Um, I, guess, I guess one of the things I've always, even before I started studying nutrition, I always sort of intuitively knew this, and I think that it's sort of silly, but it's kind of important. And that is when you're at a restaurant and you get your thing served to you that you eat, and there's like a sprig of parsley on the plate, or there's some, you know, extra lettuce and, you know, a strawberry there to decorate it. Eat your garnish. Yes. Because that garnish has a ton of really good things in it. And I always see people leaving their garnish. So eat that garnish. <laughs> Some people are getting in a week and they don't even eat that. So That's right. Small changes you can make today. Eat your garnish. Um, and how can people, how can we follow you on, on social media or how, how can people see what you're doing? Well, on Twitter, I'm at Dr. Martika. And okay. Facebook, I have a Facebook page, which is just Martika Heener, PhD. Um, okay. I don't have a website yet. That is on my list of things to do. It's been on my list for a really long time. At some point, it will pop up. Hopefully this year, we'll see. Okay, so we, but we can follow you just by looking you up on Facebook under Dr. Martiki Heater. We can follow you there. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, and I am Lauren Petra Standen. Um, you can also look me up on Facebook under Plant Based Weight Loss and Vibrant Health. And um, no one can get a hold of Peter, but that's okay. <laughs> but thank you so much. I, um, I know that everyone who will be watching this video um, has learned so much from this. And it's such a good just um, and sending Dr. Heener um, for additional um, information and common sense ways to um, continue to follow or start to transition to a whole food plant-based diet and do it in a healthy way that's really going to make you feel amazing like we all know we can we adopt this way of living. Cheers. Okay. Definitely. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you both so very much and I'll again. certainly remember to eat my garnish and in some cases maybe better to leave the food and just eat the garnish. There you go. That's right. That's right. That's what it's all about. Thank you. This was a wonderful conversation. Appreciate you both. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Dr. Heiner. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Peter. Have a great night. You too.